Joining us right now on the Beck Hill Guest Hotline, the guy that's going to be running the Wizards, the Mystics, and the Go-Go. He is the Monumental Basketball President. Let's get to know Michael Winger. Hey, Michael. Hey, fellas. How are you? Thank you for joining us. Doing great. Doing how, well. how have the well, last, thanks for having me. How have the last couple of weeks been for you since you were announced as the, uh, the, the new man in charge on May 24th? Yeah, a whirlwind. Um, yeah. You know, I spent some time closing up shop with the Clippers, saying my goodbyes, transitioning to uh, D.C., a little bit of house hunting, then immersed myself in the office just a few days ago, getting to, know the, getting to know the staff, the players, the lay of the land. And obviously we have a draft coming up in two weeks, and, you know, we've got to hit the ground running with, with, without much choice. Mm-hmm. When did the Wizards and Ted start showing interest, if you can give, like, a, a brief timeline on that? I think... Last couple of days of April, early couple of days of May, something to that effect. Um, you know, Ted did it the right way. He, he he reached out to my bosses with the Clippers, Steve Ballmer and Lawrence Frank, and unbeknownst to me, was asking for consent to speak with me. And and you know, the guys that that they are in LA, they granted that consent. And then the interview sort of picked up in earnest thereafter, probably around May one. How does that work with you when your your sole focus was the Clippers, you know, preparing for the off season, the draft with the Clippers, and then all of a sudden you got to flip the script and go, oh, I got to get really acclimated to the Wizards roster and their draft needs. How does that work? Yeah, um, the there's a um, I guess the fortunate part is what was most interesting to Ted wasn't really related to specifically Wizards roster moves, right? He was thinking more big picture. Okay. And fortunately for me, the places I've been, Cleveland, Oklahoma City, L.A., a lot of my focus has been big picture. And so the adjustments were pretty minimal. I just just sort of had to understand the D.C. marketplace a little bit, the fan base a bit. Um, Some of the bigger star players on the team, um, I wanted to make sure that I was was fluent in, in those folks, the staff. But otherwise, from a roster perspective, we didn't really get into much because I think Ted realizes that Whatever that eventual contending roster will be, it's, it's probably not this one, um, at least as as exactly constituted. Right. And so we didn't talk rosters very much. Hmm. Uh, what was it like working for Steve Ballmer out out in L.A.? I mean, he's a, a boisterous guy. I mean, he's super into his team. Obviously, uh, what's he like as a boss? And it's it's definitely a contrast to, to Ted style. You know, Ted's a little more reserved than Ballmer. What's it like working for Ballmer? <laughs> They have a lot of competitive similarities. They have a lot of the same sensibilities as, as people, as men. Um, they care about people. They care about winning. Steve, to your point, you know, he's, he, he's out there. He's, he, let, he lets his emotions run. He lets his competitive juices flow courtside in the boardroom. Um, a lot of high energy. But what, what, what Steve wants more than anything and, and what I believe Ted wants more than anything is they want the people that work in the building, players and staff included, to succeed, to do well, to enjoy the job. And they pull out all the stops to make sure those things happen. So, Michael, I was reading about you, and I saw that there's a little bit of a connection. This might be a reach, but it was one thing that jumped out at me. So we've been doing this radio show for 27 years, but we started with the cable access TV show in Bowie, and our first ever guest was Bob Ferry. Hmm. And Darn. your first yeah, job, wow. yeah, your first job in the NBA, and maybe you can talk about it, was working under Danny Ferry, who played here at Dematha. Jason played high school basketball at Dematha, so I feel like we're connected in a way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, clearly, clearly deep down, yeah. So I did work for Danny from 2005 to 2010. Um, I consider him one of my closest friends. I love him dearly, and we had the great fortune of having Danny's dad, Bob, be a scout for us for those five years. Dude, right. he's a character, so I got right? I know Bob pretty well. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now he, he, he lightens up a room. Um, he, he makes sure that we're – it's easy to get into your feelings a bit in this business. And, and he's one of those guys that can sort of grab you by the shirt collar and say, don't forget, young fella, you're, you're working in pro sports. Put a smile on that face. Let me see it. Right. So what I, – I, obviously the uh... – I don't know, the, the sort of the balancing act is trying to overhaul a roster. And I know you've been asked ad nauseum, what are you going to do with Brad? What are you going to do with Coos? What are you going to do with all these guys? So, you know, I know you've answered that a million times. But how do you balance and what's sort of been the mandate from Ted in terms of, okay, if you decide ultimately we're going to have to really overhaul this roster. I know you said 
uh, that it's not going to happen overnight. But how can you do that and, you know, still draw fans and still keep fan interest and and ensure that it's not like a five-year process before you finally start to see the fruits of your labor? I think we have to be able to balance the competitiveness and the excitement of games. I've seen a lot of a lot of teams throughout the, I don't even know how long they've been, like 18, 19 years, something like that. Um, I've seen a lot of really fun competitive teams that don't necessarily win 50 games a season. But they're in the midst of that of that process to to make sure that they're tinkering with the right folks, with the right players to get themselves to that contending status. And I think that's what we'll do. We're we're I, I would I would be extremely surprised if if we're one of those bottom out type of teams. Um, it's just not in my DNA. It, it, it's not in Will's DNA. Uh, it's not in Wes's DNA. I just I don't see that for us. Um, but uh, you know, the competitiveness will be there. The hard play will be there. The joy of basketball will be there. And I think that's what, what folks who, who tune in and watch or come to the games, that's what they're going to see. Now, you know, fingers crossed, hopefully it, it culminates in some wins. But in the absence of the wins, you know, we're going to be a fun basketball team. Joined by Michael Winger, Monumental Basketball president on the BetQL guest hotline. Now, you mentioned Wes Unsell Jr. A lot of times when you know, a new regime moves in, the, the coach is the first to go, but we know that, that Wes had the blessing of Ted. What are your impressions of Wes from you know him being a longtime assistant in the league? Now he's been here for a few years. But what are your thoughts on Wes Unsell going forward? I'm a fan. Um, mm. Wes has been a part of a lot of winning, and the uh, a lot of people don't know because we kept it pretty tight, but we interviewed Wes for the head coaching position with L.A. just a few years ago when we uh, hired Ty Lu, and Wes was, he was impressive. He's a very impressive person, a very impressive coach, a good human, a good thinker. Uh, people trust him. People like him. And at the very end of the day, if you can coach and you can get people to, to trust you and hear you, you know, that's, that's a big part of the battle, and I think that Wes is, is able to do that. And I'm really looking forward to working with him. him. Him already being here was part of the appeal of the job, frankly. Mm. So you're the team president. There's a new GM. We heard about, I forget the, the job title that Schlenk has. How will it all work when it comes to drafting players, trading away players? How will it all work? It'll probably look a little bit unorthodox. I might even, I, I might even go so far as to call it clunky at first. Um, we're going to figure it out. But at the end of the day, Will is brilliant travis is brilliant and those two guys are going to have the loudest voice on player personnel um as it relates to who who we ought to select in the draft who we ought to target in free agency whether or not whatever trade we have on the table is a balanced trade an imbalanced trade and if it's imbalanced what ought we do to make it more balanced they're going to have the loudest voice on on players but we're going to work extremely collaborative collaboratively as a group i worked with Will for seven years. He's, he's as collaborative as they come. I've done a lot of business with Travis. He's always been extremely open-minded and honest with me on the phones, doing deals. And I just I trust those guys implicitly to get in the room uh, with myself and with JT, with Wes, and you know we'll hammer out everything um, to the extent that there's a really big hard decision to make. That's my decision. Uh, but but Will's going to run the day-to-day basketball operation, and Travis is going to spend if not all of his time, certainly most of his time, just studying players around the league and around the world. So are you going to be – so, that man, you got a good gig, dude. I, I want your gig. <laughs> I, you but he's got to run the Mystics. He's got to run the Go-Go yeah, as well. Man. And you know what he's got to do? He's got to make money for Ted. Well, I know. I know. You guys, That's what you guys haven't do. gone to work in a long time either. You have a pretty darn good gig. No, you know I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, Touche. You're right there, Touche, buddy. sir. You're yeah. right there. But, <laughs> but so are you not then locked in – it's not your job then – to evaluate like the top fifteen prospects in the draft, that you're delegating that to your guys. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I will certainly study those guys closely, but not nearly as closely in Will and Travis and the scouts. Do you right. guys? I, I'm I'm somewhat panicked with the draft only being twenty days away. Now I know you guys have yeah. been in the league and you've been evaluating and doing your I, things. I wish it was twenty days away. I think it's ten days away. Oh, I'm, I'm oh, yeah. your the wrong. calendar's all bagged the up. NBA, they got to update that <laughs> website. So we're ten days away. I'm somewhat panicked about it, but I know you guys have been studying for your other organizations. How do you guys determine what the needs are here? Yeah, that, you hit it on the head. Um, the three of us in particular, 
and, and the scouts we have here on staff, they've, we've all been studying the draft for, I mean, I wouldn't even say a year, you know, multiple years. Right. And so we know the guys really, really well. Um, as to fit, you know, I think when you're drafting as high as eight, you probably don't concern yourself too much with fit, particularly if you have no real idea of what the roster is going to look like in the calendar year. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're probably going to take at eight the best player available. And then what, what we're going to spend our next, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten days on is trying to understand what the trade landscape looks like using picks, whether it's acquiring picks, maybe trading the picks. Um, you know, we, we really haven't been on the phones with other teams quite yet. So there's a lot of, a lot of business that we have to catch up on. Um, you know, other teams who didn't have front office changes, they've been conducting this type of business now for you know, the last month, and, and, and we haven't. And so we have a lot of catch-up to do on that front. Um, but we're certainly prepared for the draft. We're just we got to get ourselves up to speed on the trades.